have the pleasure of uh, having uh, Tyler Gleckler. Tyler Gleckler, um, he's joining us from Scottsdale or, or from Arizona, and um, he has uh, a lot of experience in chemistry, material science, uh, nanoscience, and he's done some research in uh, studying semiconductors and a lot of different uh, lab uh, research. Uh, so we're very happy to have him here today, and uh, he's going to share with us some of the um, research and knowledge that he has in material science and nanoscience. So I hope uh, we can all uh, learn something from this and perhaps see how we can apply it to our, uh, our work or how we think of the world going forward. So um, uh, Tyler, I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to say uh, before we get started, but uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. And the only thing I really have to say before really getting started is, of course, thank you for having me. I hope that this will be helpful for everybody, sort of regardless of the background that they come from. I'm going to cover material science and nanoscience pretty holistically. So from the perspective of somebody who might want to study it or work in these fields, or somebody who might just be sort of curious about what, what goes on in the laboratory within these disciplines. Uh, so hopefully there's a little bit uh, for everybody. And I've made it, I'm, I've tried to not talk too much so that we'll have enough time for questions afterwards if anybody's interested. And feel free to stop me whenever you'd like if there's anything you'd like to know or for me to expand on. Fantastic, Tyler. Well, I, I, I think uh, we need people in your field to help us get to the next level in human development and do all the amazing things we see in science fiction. So it all starts, I think, with materials. So, <laughs> so please uh, go ahead. And uh, I think we've got quite a few people ha that have just joined in the last few minutes. Uh, so uh, thank you. Remember, if you're coming in to just uh, mute uh, yourself uh, in case there's some background noise, and uh, that way Tyler can be heard clearly. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> um, just a brief outline for everything. I'll briefly cover my own background just so you have a good reason to sort of trust <laughs> what I'm telling you uh, and understand where I'm coming from. Um, I'll talk briefly about what material science and nanoscience actually is. Um, of course, that seems like a good starting point. Um, I'll also talk about why you might want to study material science or nanoscience, um, what type of education is needed for different career paths, um, what lab laboratory research is actually like, because I think this is a very interesting area because a lot of people don't have a good sense of what it really looks like to get your hands dirty in the lab and, and do scientific research. Um, I'll talk about a research example, kind of bringing everything together through my own experience. Um, some of the jobs and careers that are available within these fields, some future trends, and then I'll leave you with a few final thoughts. So again, sort of why listen to me, I'll make this very brief. Um, as introduced, I did both my bachelor's and my master's degree in chemistry um, with a specialization in applied materials chemistry and nanotechnology. Um, and I was fortunate enough to get the chance to study at universities quite literally across the world. So that includes a few universities in the UK, like the University of Oxford and the University of Edinburgh, uh, as well as the National University of Singapore, um, and also across the Middle East. Um, and I say this again, A, to give myself some credibility, but B, to sort of highlight the opportunities that this field sort of affords. Because for me, um, studying chemistry and taking an interest in scientific research sort of opened the world for me. I was able to to do a lot of traveling and meet a lot of incredible people purely because I was sort of hopping around laboratories and getting involved in any way that I could. Um, so again, what is material science and nanoscience? Uh, material science is hopefully somewhat self-explanatory. It's the study of materials, whether it's um, developing new materials, discovering new materials outright, engineering materials, um, because of course materials are sort of what build our world, whether we're talking about medicine or automotive parts, rocketry, really anything you can think of, at the end of the day, it's going to be constructed from something. And the better the properties are for that application, the better that that application will function. Um, so it combines a wide range of disciplines. Uh, probably the three most relevant are chemistry, physics, and engineering. But it also touches on bi uh, biology, biochemistry, um, really every other discipline of science, but is, is certainly chemistry and physics focused. Um, and again, it has a very wide range of applications as well, touching on uh, literally uh, almost everything. And then nanoscience is essentially a subset of material science. We're still talking about the study of materials, but the specific type of material that we're interested in looking at um, are nanoscale materials. And that simply refers to 
uh, the size of these materials that we're looking at, which gives them interesting properties. So nano is the prefix for billionth. So we're talking about things that are on the scale of a billionth of a meter. Um, and in that case, in, the, in case of nanoparticles and nanomaterials, we're typically talking about things that are composed of between tens to thousands of atoms. So extremely, extremely small. Really the only things smaller are individual atoms and molecules. Um, and one of the things that I would most like for you all to take away from this presentation, because you hear so much about quantum materials and nanomaterials and how this is changing the future, but it's a lot of buzzwords. So to sort of break it down to why this all matters in the first place is um, really the physics and the chemistry and, and the science changes when you go to materials of a certain size. So for example, um, the example I typically like to give is aluminum. You know, if we had an aluminum can or we, we melted a bunch of aluminum cans into, into a one kilogram block, um, that material is going to have one set of properties. It's going to conduct heat in a certain way. It's going to reflect and absorb light in a certain way and so on. You'll have one type of properties that are useful for certain applications. But then if we go to a single atom of aluminum, so the smallest that we can, before we get to particle physics and subatomic physics, um, that's where quantum mechanics takes place. And the only thing that really matters for, uh, for us right now is that when you get to the size, the atomic size, molecular size, this new physics takes hold. And it's, it's completely different than what we experience that what, with, with objects that we can see and touch. And it makes for a completely different set of properties. And the nanoscience is sort of somewhere in between. Again, we're talking about uh, nanoscale materials. So bigger than a single atom or molecule, but much smaller than having a, a kilogram of aluminum. And that will have an entirely different set of properties. Um, and continuing with the aluminum example, um, if we have an aluminum nanoparticle, so this is to say tens to hundreds of aluminum atoms kind of bundled together into a single ball, um, this almost acts as an artificial atom. And that's why those nanoparticles are, are very, very often called artificial atoms. And, you know, for example, the US military is famous for putting hundreds of millions of dollars um, into this type of research because they found that these aluminum nanoparticles, not the large scale aluminum and not atoms of aluminum, but nanoparticles are able to make jet fuel several times more efficient. So this saves the US government and militaries across the world probably at this point, hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. And this is just one application in defense. Um, it extends to, again, medicinal purposes, um, information technology, a little bit of everything. Um, so in general, uh, nanotechnology and material science really have the potential to revolutionize the world um, and change how we live our lives. So in terms of why you might want to study or work in these fields, um, again, I would say uh, this is fairly subjective um, and there's sort of an infinitely long list. It's going to be different for everybody. Um, but one of the main points, I suppose, that many of the technologies, again, that will change our world, that will shape society and how we live our lives, will very likely be underpinned by material science and nanoscience. Um, so that's very exciting. Um, on the more practical side of things, um, it's a high it's a high growth field. Um, there is consistent growing demand over the last several years, and it's expected to continue. Um, there's good compensation for many of these jobs uh, with a reasonably high degree uh, of job stability. So that's appealing for many people as well. Um, and then this is also these are very interdisciplinary fields. So for someone like myself who wasn't so interested in any particular topic or chemistry, physics, um, biology, um, I was able to sort of get experience with a little bit of everything and not restrict myself to one particular discipline. Um, and arguably most importantly is that it's just a fascinating field. I consider it sort of a, a great privilege to have the chance to be involved in this type of work and be at the cutting edge of, of human knowledge. I mean, <clears throat> in the lab, you're typically working with um, information and experiments that nobody else in the world has tried or um, knows the answer to. So it's very fulfilling when you figure out even sort of the smallest uh, detail and push forward a little bit, you're, you're contributing to the knowledge of us all. So it can be very rewarding. Um, in terms of education, um, there's definitely no correct path. There isn't a correct degree. Um, it really is going to depend on your own circumstance, the resources that are available to you, what your interests are, um, all of these different things. Um, but I would say in general, most of the work um, in these fields does require an undergraduate degree. It doesn't necessarily need to be a degree in material science, material science engineering, or nanoscience. 
Um, again, my own background is in chemistry. <laughs> Apologies. Um, but you can approach it from physics, biology, um, other engineering disciplines. Um, you can definitely have the flexibility to sort of carve out your own path because material science and nanoscience are typically specializations or subcategories of the, the broader disciplines. Um, but again, in general, the undergraduate degree is, is recommended. Uh, a master's degree, which is sort of the awkward position that I am in, um, is sort of not enough education to do the very exciting, um, the most technical laboratory research and development jobs that most people probably think of, you know, pharmaceutical, semiconductors. Um, the most sophisticated, arguably most exciting work is um, locked behind that PhD, but the master's does afford um, a broader scope of jobs and opportunities and, um, you know, it just, it just makes you all that much more competitive. And then again, the PhD, that's sort of if you're interested in going into academia or one of these higher level uh, industry jobs where you have to make that contribution to the body of human knowledge, uh, which is just, you know, a very substantial research project over a period of three to five years or more. Um, and then again, this is needed for academia, high level internships, or if you want to go into some professional jobs like uh, patent law, which I'll talk a little bit more later. Um, so again, uh, one of the things that I think is most useful or interesting to talk about is what scientific research is actually like, because a lot of people picture uh, what you see in cartoons or just mixing chemicals uh, running around the laboratory, and there is a degree of that, but um, I think a lot of people have some false assumptions and expectations. Some are good and some are bad. Um, in terms of the, the, fault, the, the maybe not so good, um, there's a lot of reading and writing. And again, this can appeal to a lot of people, but um, you know, sometimes you'll only be spending 50, 60% of the time in the lab and all of your other time will be catching up on new research, trying to get ideas from other researchers, writing up your own research, giving presentations. Um, it's a little bit of everything. So again, depending on who you are and what you like, this can be a good or a bad thing. Um, it also can pose safety hazards. Again, with, with proper practice, there's really nothing hazardous about any of these fields, regardless of the research you're doing. Um, but you have to have a lot of trust in the people who are working around you. You have to have a lot of trust in your own abilities. Um, but again, because sort of the stakes are so high, for me, this is something that I feel just encourages really learning the material and learning how to operate in the laboratory um, as properly and safely as possible. Um, and then some of the things that are more obviously positive um, are that it's, highly, it's both highly independent as well as highly collaborative. And again, this will depend on your circumstance, uh, who your coworkers are, who sort of the big uh, boss researcher is in the lab, your, your PI if it's at, uh, in academia. Um, but sometimes you might have weeks at a time where you're really working alone because a lot of the times people don't have the answer, what you're looking for. Um, people might be able to help here or there, but the nature of research is you're researching, you're trying to figure out something completely new. So oftentimes uh, you will feel on your own. And again, that can be good and bad. But on the other side, um, you know, you'll very often find yourself asking uh, for help, whether it's using a, one particular instrument or um, just some advice about an experiment you're thinking of or how to improve it. So you will be working a lot with people in your lab, people in next door labs, people just in your discipline at conferences online. Um, there's a lot of collaboration in general. So. For me, again, I, I quite like this because there are periods of extreme independence and then periods of extreme collaboration, as well as everything in between. Um, and then it's a nice combination of creative and analytical skills, because as much as the math and the science is, is dominant and it's important that you know these things and know how to, again, operate safely and productively in the lab, there's a lot more creativity than I think most people realize. Um, so maybe you have to build a new setup for a new type of measurement uh, for something that your lab is working at. Well, obviously that's sort of an engineering project, but you really do have to get creative with, with how you use the resources at your material. Scientific funding is extremely scarce. So it's important that you spend that, that money very wisely and that you're only sort of getting what you need and uh, making it as efficient as possible. So, I'll go ahead and give you um, a bit of an example uh, through my own work. This is sort of a, a summary of the work that I was doing with my master's degree. Um, and this is just an, a hopefully interesting but arbitrary example. There's so much going on in both of these fields that, um, you know, this is, this is a very small piece of the puzzle. 
Um, but my own research was studying um, what's called semiconductor quantum dots, which is uh, an overly sophisticated name for something that ultimately is, is fairly straightforward. Um, so to break that down, they're semiconductor because the material that these nanomaterials are made of are semiconductors. So uh, things like silicon or selenium or a few other elements on the periodic table. Um, and they're called uh, quantum dots. Quantum because, again, when you get to these very, very small sizes, you start to have quantum mechanical effects that takes place. So the physics and the chemistry is changing. Um, and then uh, nanocrystals or dots, just because these are typically small spheres of crystalline material. So on the left here, you can see um, a small example, like a, an illustration, a graphic illustration, where you can see, again, tens to, or per perhaps hundreds to thousands of atom atoms bundled here. In this case, this material, or this quantum dot, is supposed to be made of cadmium, but again, it can be made of, of really anything. Um, and then that's what the semiconductor core is made of. And then on the surface, these squiggly lines, is you can attach all sorts of other molecules to sort of play with their properties. Depending on how many, how long those, those uh, chains are, you can modulate the properties and try to sort of hone in on exactly what you're looking for. And then these two middle images, these are actually from what's called an electron microscope. So it's basically just taking a very, very high resolution, resolution image. Um, so you can see two different types just to show you sort of the diversity of these. Here, these are nice spheres, and below we have some sort of nice sort of pyramids. And again, there's, there's really every geometry and morphology that you can really think of. But you can see this is 20 nanometers, so these are extremely small. They're about four to five nanometers independently. So what you're looking at is really only, again, a few hundred atoms. I mean, we are looking at, at the root of material. So these pictures alone, I think, are really amazing. But the thing that's really amazing is the way that these quantum dots work and what makes them such an exciting area of research is that you're actually able to change their properties just by changing their size. So you're not changing what they're made of, you're not changing their shape, you're not changing anything except for how big they are. So here I have an example um, with these colored vials. So everything in these vials is made of the exact same thing. We have quantum dots of the same kind, just with increasing and decreasing size. So the smaller they are, the more towards the purple end of the visible spectrum that they'll be. And the larger they are, the more towards the red and the orange that they'll be. Um, and this, the details sort of aren't so relevant here, but the idea is basically that the energy of light that these particles will absorb and emit depends on their size. So simply by changing sort of how long you're baking these for, you can control how big that they're growing or how, how small that they're growing and then change the size. And one of the things that this is interesting for is something like, um, you may have heard of QLED displays. These are um, some of the very high-end new types of TVs and monitors. Well, the way this work is they take essentially a piece of glass and then um, a, something called a, a transparent conductive electrode, which is just what you have on your smartphone. It's just a, a uh, electrically conductive, transparent glass-like material that gets coated on top of the normal glass. And then on top of that, they very carefully place all of these quantum dots all across the surface of the screen. And then they're able to get these very rich, vibrant colors uh, with very high fidelity. So the reds look very red, uh, the blues look very blue, and so on. Um, but it goes well beyond something simple or, or sort of simple uh, like displays. Um, it also applies to medicine. So, you know, if, if you're screening for cancer, for example, what we use now typically involves radioactive materials. Um, so cancer cells will take up glucose. So what they'll do is they'll, they'll give a patient um, an injection of sugar, essentially, that will have radioactive carbon atoms. And then what they can do is they can give you a scan of your body um, and see where the tumors are and where the cancer cells are, depending on um, which place it, locations and which cells in your body are uptaking that glucose. Um, and you can only detect that because of the radioactive signals that are that are decaying off of, of that radioactive sugar. Um, but of course, as, as amazing as that is, and as many lives as it's certainly saved, um, you're still putting radioactive materials into somebody's body. So this is uh, not ideal and uh, might contribute to further complications in the future. So another interesting example is they are thinking, well, these quantum dots have really interesting properties in the way that they emit light. So instead, perhaps we could use these type of materials um, to inject into the person's body to search for cancer. 
So that could be a much healthier, much more sustainable way of doing that as well as more cost effective. And then, there we go. Um, in terms of the careers, um, I sort of broken it down into three categories. First is the research and development careers. Um, this is sort of what you traditionally think of, again, laboratory work, regardless of whether we're talking about more chemistry, physics, biology focused, but laboratory work. Uh, and that can typically be divided into two categories. There's academia, which is just trying to become a professor and working at a university doing research there, um, or industry. So working for any of these uh, big companies that might be doing research from pharmaceutical research, semiconductor research, specialty chemicals, and much more than that. But the point is outside of, of, of research being conducted at universities. So I'd say that's most of the jobs that are available, um, un unsurprisingly. But the second category is professional jobs. There are some people, um, some very brave people, if you're asking me, who will um, get their even their PhD in one of these fields, and then they'll go back to school again for something like a law degree. And then they will do patent law because you need both the legal background as well as the scientific or engineering expertise to file and manage these patents. And it's an incredibly lucrative career if you're willing to suffer through the, the never ending school that, that is required to get you there. Um, you can also do consulting, which is something that I had done, um, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Or yeah, I, I'll actually say a few words now. Um, consulting is one of those things that you hear a lot about um, and is available for sort of everybody in every field, but doesn't mean all that much. Um, it will really depend on the firm and again, your own interests. Um, so there's a lot of variation. In my case, I worked uh, for a firm that specialized in the chemicals and materials space. So I would work with um, industry leaders and try to gather market information to write reports um, and do a bit of an analysis on whether um, a particular market was growing or shrinking or trying to recommend how much they might want to invest in a particular product. Um, so it's a little bit of everything and it's it's very appealing for a lot of people because it's so flexible and there's there's so much so much diversity in what you're doing, which can be very appealing. And then even uh, there, Tyler, we, we hmm? have a quick question in the chat. Yeah. Yes, of course. From Alice Canny. Is the body able to naturally eliminate the quantums in injected in a body through screening once the cancer screening is completed? So it's a really great question, of course. And the answer is it's sort of unknown. And that's exactly why we're yet to be using um, this technology in a lot of modern medical practices. There's a lot of research being done. I think we're still at the stage where we're not even quite so far along where we're doing clinical trials to do that. I think there's been some work along those lines. But for the moment, um, those health and safety concerns are exactly why we've yet to start doing it to, to many patients. Okay, please, pr please proceed. Of course. Um, yeah, so the, there's, there's also sort of just an other category because like any other degree, um, you can sort of do whatever you can, can make work with it. And, and I think I'm a good example just because I did my time in, in the academic research um, and as well as in the professional world, but at this point in my career, I've sort of decided to go a completely different way, which is why I'm sitting here now with you. I've been doing a lot of scientific writing and communicating, um, and it's sort of a combination of entrepreneurial and a, a creative work. Um, I mean, for me, at the end of the day, I, I really love science and technology, um, but I wasn't, I grew sort of tired of being in the laboratory, um, but it should be noted that I'm sort of in the minority, the vast majority of people um, who get us as, as far as I went with the education, really love it and they love being in the lab and they actually couldn't imagine doing the type of thing that I'm that I'm now interested in. So there's something for everybody for sure. And it's 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 an extremely useful skill set, regardless of what you're interested in. Um, and then in terms of future trends, I, I've probably already sort of spelt it out um, at this point, but I just want to emphasize again that these fields will be what contributes to many of the technologies that completely change the world. And I've already given you a few examples. I'll give you uh, two other quick ones. Um, something that researchers in my own lab did um, a little bit before our, my time there, um, as unbelievable as it sounds, is they're looking to use these, these quantum dots as a way of making an artificial retina. So for people who are certain types of people who are blind, um, they're trying to reconstruct a retina because, again, the way these particles work is you have light coming in, they hit these particles, they absorb the light, and then they will re-emit that light. So that's sort of, 
sort of how the eye works in the sense that if you could construct an artificial retina, you'd have light coming in from the world. Um, you could have sort of a unit in there that's based on those nanoparticles to process that light, which could then be emitted into some sort of sensor and then integrated with your brain, as amazing as that is. And that's work that's actively going on right now and has progressed much farther than probably most people realize. Um, the other big one that's probably worth mentioning because you hear so much about it in the news and online um, is quantum computing. Um, so, you know, I'm no expert in this field, but I, will, I think it's worth giving a brief explanation. Um, you know, typical computers, when you get to sort of the base level of it, they use binary. So this is just zeros and ones, and that's sort of the fundamental language of computer code. Um, and that has to do with sort of what's going on in the hardware, because in a transistor, we have an on or an off state, which gets translated in computer language to a one or a zero. And the idea with quantum computing is by using these nanomaterials and quantum materials and, and quantum mechanics in general, we're able to have a world where we don't have to choose between zero and one, but we can have zero and one at the same time. So you have exponentially more computational power. And um, that might sound very uninteresting or not particularly useful, um, but I can promise that it is both of those things. Um, and one of the best examples that comes to mind uh, for the use of this is something like medicine um, development. Because, for example, at the moment, if we want to do pharmaceutical research or any type of medical research, a lot of it involves going to the laboratory and sort of searching for the right protein, uh, again, the right drug, the right whatever it is, um, for a particular illness or disease. And the way, the, the amount of power that comes with, with quantum computing would allow us to essentially leave the laboratory a lot of the time and just do these experiments computationally. So you, we, you can iterate all of these different combinations of drugs and, and biochemical interactions, and then only do the last experiment. At the end of the day, you need to, of course, go back into the lab and verify that what you've done on the computer is true in, in physical reality. But with a computer of this power, you could do this very reliably. And this would save years and years and years um, of research. It would save probably billions of dollars in only a short period of time. And it would advance us to so much more sophisticated um, medicines and, and other um, chemical solutions in general um, so much more quickly. But it goes beyond that. There, it, it touches on really all the most exciting sectors and industries, renewable energy. Um, a lot of you know, solar cells often can make use of nanomaterials. That is a, that is a big area of research at the moment. Um, we have information technology and computing, which is what I just sort of covered, medicine as well. Um, manufacturing in more ways than, than I can count, um, and then defense as in the example I gave earlier. But again, the list is much longer than this. It extends to really every facet of life and, and developing technologies. Tyler, I have a question. Mm -hmm. I, it used to be that nanotechnology was associated with like the fullerene molecule, carbon-based mm -hmm. fullerenes. Is that still the same use of the nanotechnology or is it, in, is it incorporating other types of molecules and atoms? It's a little bit of everything, yeah. So the, the C60, the fullerenes you're referring to, is sort of one state of carbon. And another one that you may have heard of that's, that's kind of uh, got a lot of attention and is really exciting is graphene. Um, so yeah, that still falls within the category of nanoscience. Essentially, the only condition is if it's small enough, it's nanoscience. Just because, again, at those scales, that's where that exciting chemistry and physics is taking place. So yes, it, it does include things like graphene and, and uh, fullerenes. Thank you. Of course. Um, so final, I'll leave you with some final thoughts and then we can go through questions as long as you all would like. Um, I would say that there's, there's three sort of biggest takeaways. The first is that um, a lot of people do this for sort of more pragmatic reasons. Oh, sorry, I think, I think there's a question. Or, uh, or, uh, yes, uh, from Denaline. I'm asking her to unmute right now. Oh, so right. there you go, Denaline, Noel. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We can hear you. My question is concerning the future strength. Mm -hmm. The future strength. We talk the material science and manual science will we underpin many of the most important future technologies like in the field of renewable energy, mm -hmm. information technology and computing. 
medicine, manufacturing and defense. My question is like, I would like to find out from you, what about the impact of this nanoscience on the environment? Precisely it impact, it impact on the sustainable development of the world. Thank you very much. Yeah, of course. And it's a good question. And it's, it's actually a very, it's a highly researched aspect of all of this because um, like anything else, there's sort of pros and cons that need to be managed very carefully. So like I said, a lot of solar technologies can be developed with nanoparticles and nanomaterials. Um, and that's very exciting. That's very good. That's exactly what we're looking to work towards. But at the same time, we need to be very careful because um, if we do let these nanoparticles, um, let's say we had a very large quantity of these quantum dots to enter the environment, they could pose a lot of environmental risks. Um, that includes medicine after it's converted into waste. Um, really anywhere that these nanomaterials are being used, we need to look very carefully about whether they will have a negative environmental impact. And the answer is definitely yes, some of the time and strongly no other times. But that's why we, every time these different technologies are rolled out, a lot of effort is spent to make sure um, that we really understand what the impact and the consequences of these things are. Um, and there are already examples of where they've had to sort of abandon, abandon a particular application because uh, it was proven environmentally detrimental. I think there's a few more questions. Um, you, do you want to finish up the presentation? Then we'll just sure, go. Uh, yeah, I, I just have a few final thoughts and then we can just go into that. Yeah. Um, that's yeah. So again, just a, a few key takeaways, I suppose. Um, a lot of people will go into this sort of field just because they, they hear about how lucrative it can be or some, uh, some other appeal about the job. But I think first and foremost, that's all fine and good. And that, that's something to, to be drawn to. Um, but I think it's important to first and foremost, have an interest and a curiosity about the natural world. Because without this, I don't think it's something that will make you happy, will make you fulfilled, um, and will lead to a successful career. Um, the second thing is that the work is challenging. Um, but again, it offers enormous benefits to the world, uh, or at least potential benefits to the world. And it's intellectually challenging. So it's something where you'll never feel like you're just sort of working through paperwork or whatever it might be. It's something where you really feel you can you can trace your impact um, to real life. And it's always keeping your mind uh, fresh and active, I suppose. And then um, there's, again, on the more pragmatic note, there's a very positive outlook for the future. They're expected to continue having a high demand, um, an increasingly high demand, um, and maintain their job stability and, and the diversity of work that's available. So um, again, thank you. We'll have questions now, but I just want to say if anyone wants to reach out with any questions they didn't get to ask, I'm very happy to to correspond with you. So please don't hesitate to reach out. This is sort of how I live my life and I would be very happy to assist or answer any questions. So thank you all for listening. All right, great. Good job. We're going right into the questions. Here we go. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm Mr. Um, Mr. Ramdam Keso from Ethiopia. So I have a question for uh, our presenter. Uh, what is the relation between the semiconductors and the nanotechnology material? How they will be related? As a, a laboratory technician, is there any possibilities to formulate this um, semiconductor from the local available material easily? Uh, can you fill out the system? Okay, thank you. So uh, both good questions. Um, in the case of the first one, the, the nanoparticles or the nanomaterials, they can be made of sort of anything you'd like. So semiconductors are just an, is just a name for a type of, of atom in the periodic table. So again, the most famous example is silicon. Um, so essentially, if you just have very small amounts of silicon, if we use the quantum dot example that I keep bringing up, um, if we have, let's say, a thousand atoms of silicon, and they're in a crystal, a very, very tiny crystal, again, on the, on the billionth of a meter scale, well, that's a semiconductor nanocrystal. So we're talking about semiconductors and we're talking about nanomaterials and nanoparticles. So it's really just a matter of, of selecting the semiconductor materials. Um, 
And then I'm not sure if I caught your second question completely. So if you don't mind uh, repeating that, or if anyone might have been able to hear that a little bit more clearly. I think the question had to do with what sort of materials could one use locally to try and build these things? Uh, yeah, um, the main restriction in terms of materials, there's a lot of flexibility. Um, the difficulty is the way that these materials are made can be very complicated. And I'll give you uh, again, probably the best example is what we were talking about before graphene. Um, I mean, this is something that won the Nobel Prize a handful of years ago. This is considered a big breakthrough. And uh, very famously, it was made using scotch tape. The, the method they use is literally called the scotch tape method. And what they would do is they would take a pencil and, and draw, draw a little bit of where you have uh, uh, just some graphite that you deposit onto the paper. And then you take pieces of tape and you essentially just lay it on top of the graphite and you peel it off. And every time you peel it off, you're getting a thinner and thinner layer on the tape. So then you can take two pieces of tape and rip them apart, rip them apart, rip them apart. Um, and within that, on the final layer of tape, once you've done it, you know, five to ten times, there will be nano, uh, there will be graph graphene. So a single layer, a single atomic layer of carbon. The the issue is, um, while you are able to make graphene or other nanomaterials in a very simple way, they're typically not going to be usable in this way. So to get the type of nanomaterials, um, especially if it's something involving semiconductors that's useful um, in a lot of industries, um, this will require um, more sophisticated synthesis um, processes and uh, equipment. Okay, let's go on to Dr. Alakimo Diallo. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I, I, I have to, to have you on, on this on this line uh, that you are a specialist in, in on nanotechnology. Uh, as specialist in computer science, nano chemistry and nanotechnology is very, very important for us. Because uh, now I, I I have some question for you. Mm -hmm. uh, in regarding that, when we divide one meter by by thousand, we have millimeter. Yes. When divide one millimeter by, by thousand, we have micrometer. Mm -hmm. By when divide one millimeter by one million, we have nanometer. Mm -hmm. This is nanoscale. How how today how how we can build device to, to, to use this, uh, it, this thing. It is possible or it is just uh, for, for publicity or for marketing. It is amazing, right? I mean, that's the idea is it, it's, it's yeah. almost hard to believe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, we, we are. There are, um, there are many different ways to make these type of materials. So I'll give you uh, probably one of the more common or, or one of the ways we can make a lot of it uh, very quickly. Um, it's called, uh, none of none, the details don't really matter, but I, I will give them to you just to hopefully make it more clear. It's called a chemical vapor deposition. So essentially what it is, is you have this big oven, you have a very large oven, and in the middle of the oven, you have a, uh, a quartz or a glass tube. And essentially what you do is you, just put all of the chemicals that you are interested in into the tube in a very particular way and you turn on the oven and you heat the oven very 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 high where all of those chemicals are able to uh, vaporize so go from the solid to the gaseous state and then you flow gas through this tube and what you do is you basically provoke the atoms to go from the vapor state um, to come in contact with the surface of a piece of glass or or one of those transparent conductive electrodes, and then the atoms deposit on top. And the longer you do it, the thicker it's going to be, but it happens very, very slowly. And it can be controlled with how fast the gas is going through that tube. It can be controlled by the temperature, how far everything is from, from uh, apart from one another. So it took a lot of experimentation to get to the point where now it's, it's a relatively simple thing to do. Um, but yes, we do have ways of, of making huge, huge sheets of, of a single atomic layer or only a few atomic layers um, 
or in the example of the pictures that I that I showed previously, those were made um, in a way that wouldn't be useful for making very large scales, but is very useful for the laboratory, um, where it's your sort of in what you imagine in a in a typical chemistry laboratory, a bunch of beakers and flasks and and glass columns that are coming out sort of every different which way, um, and you essentially just put everything in, um, heat it up turn it on and then you have to just time it perfectly because the longer that that reaction goes on, the more that the crystals will continue to grow. So you need to cut it off at just the right time so they don't get too big or, or aren't left too small. And, and these are just two of the ways. There are many, many different ways. Um, and some of which, especially the ones that they're using at companies like Samsung to make those QLED displays. Um, mo we don't really know how they're making a lot of this because it, it's proprietary and uh, they have some trade secrets and how they're making so many uh, so quickly. Uh, and, and I, I think uh, when it's used in medical field, we can, uh, we can maybe we can build a, we can dig, build a nano, nano microbe, nano, na, na, nano life to, to fight cancer and in other. I hope so. I hope so. And, and you're right, that is a whole other area of research, building little robots. <laughs> okay, we have a question in chat um, from Alice Scunny again. Could you please explain what is the life cycle of the nanoparticles after it serves it, its purpose? Like, uh, where are they used? Yeah, items, where are the used items stored or what do we do with it? Um, that, that one really will depend on the detail because, you know, for example, in a lot of medical purposes, um, especially if it's being injected into somebody to, to do a, a scan looking for cancer or something of the sort, um, of course, ultimately, this is going to be excreted as waste. And in that case, it's ultimately going to be going to the environment. So that's a good example where we either need to make sure that the body is breaking it down so that upon excretion, it's not going to enter the environment in a, in a hazardous way, or that if it does enter the environment, it isn't posing a risk. Um, but for the most part, a lot of these different applications, um, they're very stable. Um, we don't expect them to really degrade. Um, in the case of the solar panels, for example, um, I certainly hope that you know if we are using nanomaterials in the solar panel, um, they won't sort of slowly, as the panels age, be, be let off into the environment. They're typically uh, very good about applying certain coatings or um, processing everything in such a way that um, it's kind of insulated and, and these particles won't enter the environment. But it will really depend on the specific application and then the specific material. Now there's a question from Steve Kalpi. Can materials be used from recycling, or I think, can materials be created from recycling products? Yeah, they definitely can. Um, again, uh, I sound a little bit like a broken record, but it will really depend. But in principle, yes, because like I said, there's nothing magical about the materials themselves. Uh, I gave the example of aluminum. Um, it's just aluminum. I mean, it's the same. We're talking about aluminum, just like aluminum from an aluminum can. Um, now, you can't just take, for example, an aluminum can uh, and at least very easily convert that into uh, nanomaterials. Typically, the chemicals, the, even the aluminum chemicals that would be used to make these sorts of things um, would be a, a more specialized, specific type of molecule. But at the end of the day, the, the final product will be aluminum or silicon or cadmium or any of these other materials um, that you could make from recycled materials. So if you made the the, the precursor material, the, the reaction, the reactants from recycled materials, yeah, you could. And, I'm, and I, would, I would almost guarantee that there's active research being done to this end. I remember uh, back in the late 80s, I visited a laboratory where they were making foliarines. And I was able to touch it, see it, and they were talking about how they were making it by shining a, um, almost like a laser beam into some carbon and having the fullerenes produced. And so I, I said, what, what you might want to do is have two lights from 90 degree angles 
up to different frequencies, like a blue and a red, mm -hmm. and impact that zone at the same time that you're going in with the laser light. And they were able to calculate that they would go from about 20% efficiency to about 60 to 80% efficiency. So I that was my little contribution to a laboratory back in the late 80s. That's a, that's a, that's a contribution to be proud of, I would say. That's, that's a big Im improvement in efficiency. I mean, even a few percent is great. So that, that's, that's enormous. And, and so, so your focus right now, is it in the research of the, of the chemistry of it, or is it in the consulting, teaching, financial part of it? Yeah, so my my own career at this point is more focused on the communication, the teaching. Um, I do a lot of scientific writing for for small businesses or for publications. Um, so I'm more on the communication side of thing. Um, but I spent something like seven years regularly working in in laboratories again across the world. Some of them material science engineering, some of them material science, uh, chemistry, um, even electrical engineering. I had some experience. So I got my hands dirty in a, in, a, in a bunch of these different disciplines and was able to sort of get a more holistic picture of the material science and nanoscience space. Do you have a, a professional blog or a YouTube channel? I have a, I have a podcast, which is why I have, I can't see it here. I have a little bit of a setup. Um, it's called Wiser Tomorrow, um, if any of you are interested. Uh, that's another thing um, that doing this type of work more entrepreneurially has sort of afforded me. And I've gotten the chance to speak with um, physicists from Harvard um, or some famous other online educators, um, hopefully some Nobel laureates in the upcoming future. But yeah, that's another thing that I I'm actively working on. Okay, we have a question from Dr. V Vedestas Belinga. Most rural, rural people in Africa have less knowledge on this how this topic can can move to the how can this topic be improved through Africa, the rural development? So how can how can you get how can you make this a reality there? I think a lot of different ways. Um, one of the first things I would say is that there's so much there's so much work to still be done that there's opportunities for everybody to get involved. I mean, we have probably hundreds more years before we really have a mastery of these topics. So in general, I would say there's a huge way to get involved. Um, the other thing is that thankfully, especially at this stage, there's a lot of ways because some, some research is limited where you need the funding, you need to be Harvard, you need to be MIT, you need to be these big fancy universities who have all of the funding in the world to, to do as they wish. But a lot of the nanoscience research um, is more, rel more reliant on your own analytic abilities and your creative abilities. There's enormous potential. Um, like I said, the two researchers um, who are from the UK who won the Nobel Prize for developing graphene did it with tape. And they actually did it outside of their normal laboratory hours. They did it um, they, on, on weekends. They would come in, uh, these two professors, and they would essentially dedicate half of, of their, their weekend to just sort of doing the experiments that they wish they could do that the university wouldn't be so happy with them doing as their full-time job. So it took nothing other than two people who are extremely passionate about the topic and some scotch tape. So, you know, I think Africa is famous for the ingenuity and the creativity. So if anything, I would say that's, that's the breeding ground for the type of developments that we do need to take the field to the next step. What is your view on thought experiments? Uh, a simple answer is I love them. I think that they are the basis of, of, of all academic and intellectual thinking, um, even in chemistry. I mean, I think a lot of people make the mistake or, or uh, material science or um, nanoscience is that they sort of just rush into the lab and they start doing experiments. Well, the most useful thing you can do is really take time in advance. Um, and again, this goes well beyond the scope of, of these fields is to um, think about them in extreme detail, spend the time rolling these thoughts through your head and considering what would, if this is true, what would that mean? If this is true, what would that mean? Um, and going through every scenario and trying to come up with these interesting thought experiments um, that really can give you confidence in, in the usefulness of an idea or the possibility of an idea or, or the morality of an idea. So I think they're extremely useful and extremely fun. I have a question from Siobhan Zachariah. 
In regard to the renewable energy, can we expect the nanotechnology to bring the cost of solar panels down to be affordable? Um, I, I short answer again, I think is uh, yes, and I hope so. Um, the most exciting um, development in that way is there's another type of nanoparticle that I won't I won't bore you with with more technical jargon, but it's called a perovskite. Um, it's just another type of of nano crystal that offers enormous potential for solar panels. Um, first of all, it would be very much more efficient and it would be uh, much more cost effective. Um, and then again, this is only just one of the exciting directions. So some of these particles, some of these materials, again, they're not made from anything special. They're not made from gold or platinum or palladium. They're made from simple, um, some of the most common elements uh, in the Earth's crust. So if we can learn how to make those well and make them efficiently, um, I think it's a very sustainable uh, way forward. And back to this question from Danaline, um, the nano waste, how is it used in the environment? How does it affect the environment? So what is nano waste? Yeah, so um, in terms of what nano waste is, it's, it's again, really any of these nanoparticles, nanomaterials um, that are entering the environment that are being disposed of. But um, for example, in the laboratory, um, most of, regardless of the laboratory, regardless of the application, which is still where most of these nanomaterials are being used, um, we're still a little bit early to seeing the wide scale application of all of these things. So the, the majority of those being produced and experimented with are in uh, university and industry laboratories. And in those cases, they manage the waste very carefully. Um, depending on, you know, as with any laboratory, depending on the type of waste they have, it gets divided into organic, non-organic, liquid, solid, um, and then the universities typically have these very sophisticated means um, of separating and treating this waste. So um, in the universities and again in, in the industry labs, this is how that works. And that's, that's good because that makes it um, more of a surefire way that it's not going to enter the environment in a negative way. The question does become much more um, uh, concerning when you talk about these products and services actually entering the market. And in that case, again, it's going to be a case-by-case -case basis. Um, sadly, um, I can't, I'm not so optimistic that I don't expect that some of these products, some of these nanomaterials that find applications in, in so many different things probably will um, at least initially have an environmental impact. I mean, this seems to be uh, what we as humans have a have a very bad history of doing, which is being a little bit careless in the beginning, sort of realizing our mistake and then rolling it back. So hopefully we won't start doing that too badly, but inevitably I think there will be an issue with nano waste entering the environment. And that's why we need to be very careful uh, with how we use these materials and uh, when we use them. I have a question from Alex. Ajibade, what's the greatest discovery in quantum nano nanotechnology? Ooh, it's a very good question. The greatest discovery, well, I would say that it's it's certainly subjective. There isn't, uh, I don't think there's anything that most scientists or most researchers would say is this is this is the one we all agree on. Um, in my opinion, um, it might be those those quantum dots I keep talking about. I mean, I'm very biased. This is what my own research was about. Um, but my research was about it because I find them so amazing. And um, probably the best way to explain that is the the professor that I had the chance to work under for this research. He his vision was to sort of create an entire new branch of of chemistry because, as I said, these are these are often called artificial atoms. So what can you do with artificial atoms? Well, you can combine them to make artificial molecules. So there's a whole world out there that's still yet to be really discovered. And in my opinion, I think that's really going to uh, shape the world pretty significantly. So it's a little early to call that the, the best discovery, but 50 to 100 years down the line, it very well uh, might be agreed upon by everyone. Uh, another question from Lumbayi Ilunga. Is nano, can nanotechnology and biomass work together? Um, again, interesting question, and I would say yes. This is not an, uh, an area I'm too familiar with, um, but one thing that comes to mind that could be interesting um, is for, and this is a very difficult balance. I, I, on the one hand, these materials pose a potential threat to the environment. 
Um, but as we've said, they also pose a potential benefit. And one of the examples is um, I showed you in sort of that image of that graphic illustration, um, there are molecules that can be placed on the surface that sort of stick to the surface and then uh, change the properties. Well, those are organic molecules. Um, so there's a chance that you could use this potentially as a form of waste cleanup if you could get a particular type of biomass or biological material to stick to the surface um, of these particles. And then if you had a way to then go and collect them, that would sort of be the challenging part. Um, and then again, because they have so many different biological applications, um, yes, certainly there's a lot of a lot of potential to be worked with biomass uh, in one way or the other. Here's a question from Alice Ghani. Could nanotechnology be considered to eradicate genetically modified products in agriculture? Um, I don't think so. I don't think, you know, it's again, it's, it's incredibly powerful. Um, as I keep saying, I really think it's going to, to disproportionately shape the world. But I think that what GMOs offer um, probably couldn't be replaced with what nanotechnology can offer. Um, again, I'm, that's, that's definitely not my area of expertise. So take that with a grain of salt. I don't wanna say it's impossible or anything like that. Um, but as far as I'm aware, I don't think it would have that ability. Another question from Alex. What brief explanation can you give on carbon nanotubes? Yeah, um, carbon nanotubes are, are like graphene. They're one of those, of those very exciting um, nanomaterials that you hear a lot about. Um, and they're very similar to graphene in, in why people care about them. Uh, so just as a brief explanation, again, if you have a single layer of carbon, so you just have, uh, you know, we're not talking about atom on, atoms on atoms on atoms, we're talking about carbon atoms, sort of uh, this way and that way, in the same way I, I was describing how it was made with tape. Well, if you kind of fold that together into a cylinder, now you have a carbon nanotube. And what makes them exciting is they conduct electricity extremely well. And that's one problem we have with a lot of power generation and, and transfer and storage and so on, is that you lose a lot of energy when it's being transferred around within an actual uh, electronic or certainly across long distances when the energy is being uh, transported. So if you can move that electricity around very, very efficiently with a very, very conductive material, well, then the, the whole system is so much more efficient. So carbon nanotubes are one type of material uh, that offer enormous potential to to change our electronics because of large, mostly because of how conductive that they are. Okay, now we have a question from Karen and de Cruz. For nanotechnology to replace damaged retina, would the nanotechnology be connected to the optic nerve signaling the, to replicate rods and cones? That's a, a that's actually such a good question that it's beyond my own scope of knowledge. I don't know. I'm very happy. If you are very interested, please feel free to email me and I can dig up that paper and, and find that and send that over to you. Um, I don't know. And I don't know the researchers in the lab that I worked at. I'm not familiar with uh, exactly what they were doing. And I know they were collaborating with the medical school as well as a team of electrical engineers. So I would imagine that there's, there's a, a number of different ways to go about making it. But uh, on the top of my head, I'm not exactly sure how they've, how they've engineered that. One of the one of the products that come from nanotechnology are batteries. I, this is a big part of nanotechnology, correct? Yeah, battery research is a huge field. Are, are they satisfied with the results so far, or do they know there's a there's so much more potential to get so much more efficient with batteries? There, there's a lot of room to grow still. A lot of room to grow still. Um, the, the leading battery technology now, as, as I'm sure everybody knows, is lithium ion batteries, and they're really great for, for many different reasons, um, but lithium is an extremely scarce resource um, and growing ever more in demand and expensive, and we should really sort of reserve it for certain things. It's also highly flammable, um, so it has several negative downsides. Um, in terms of the new battery materials, um, it's kind of a question of charging and discharging, because when you use a battery, essentially the material within the battery, the charged material is shifting um, back and forth. And the more efficiently it can convert from one, one stage to another uh, without getting clogged, without having one of a number of different issues, the more efficient the battery will be. So there's definitely, definitely a long way to go in terms of 
the life cycles. So how many times you can charge a battery um, and then use it without it losing its capacity, um, as well as just the energy density. So how much energy can you put in that battery to begin with? And I think in my own opinion, and I, I think the opinion of many other people, um, we were just at the beginning. I think we'll get so much farther. Um, and as you said, nanotechnology, that is another great example of, of what will underpin it because a lot of these nanomaterials will um, are just so much more conductive. They're so much more resilient. They're so much more flexible. You can tailor them so much better. So they will certainly make big contributions to batteries. Do you get the sense that there's just a really simple solution to the battery? Um, I don't think so, actually. I, you know, again, I always leave the door open for something like that because so often in science, the simple solution ends up being really the best solution or if not just the correct solution. But in the case of batteries, I, I have had some experience doing my own research with batteries um, and it's just, it's just seemingly ever more complicated. So that might just be because we're too sort of early in the research process. Things typically get simpler, you know, later on once we really understand them. But there's so many things going on within a battery um, that there's just a lot of room for, for different issues. Uh, let's see, question from Manuel Owode. Is there approval to use nanotechnology in surgery? Mm, as far as I know now, I don't believe so. The one exception could be um, perhaps even for certain tools, um, they might give them additional strength or additional some sort of properties that might enhance the, the specific tool that they're using. Uh, that's just speculative, though. There's, there's nothing that comes to mind that applies too much to surgery. Um, well, actually, I, will, I, I do have one example. Another thing that was, that was being researched in, in the lab I was at um, was using uh, zinc oxide um, nanoparticles, so just another uh, fairly common material in the form of these small nanoparticles to be used for healing wounds. So they did experiments um, you know, for, on mice where essentially they would, they would inject <laughs> two different wounds into these mice and they would leave one to heal naturally. And then they would place these zinc oxide nanoparticles in the wound of the other, the other puncture wound. And what they found is that it, would, it helped heal the wound several times more quickly. And the reason it did that is these, these nanoparticles in this case have antimicrobial properties. So bacteria just can't really begin to grow or, or grow very successfully. So by coating the wound with the zinc oxide nanoparticles, they're able to see a quicker and better recovery. So that's still, again, very early stages. I think that we can expect to, to, to hit the medical field more quickly. Um, but I, I certainly anticipate them starting to do, uh, certainly after they sew a patient back up, um, potentially using those type of nanoparticles to prevent infection and to reduce scarring. As you look at the way the nanotechnology can be used, what other products and services or, th or things can be are, are fertile areas of research? Um, within, within the scope of nanoscience and material science, correct? Yes. Mm, uh, again, like I'll start with the biggest, broadest answer, which is quite literally everything because, you know, even just looking around my room, if we take, if we take tables, if we take automotives, if we take really all of the things that we interface with most frequently, we can make uh, safety improvements to, to motor vehicles by making just incorporating these nanomaterials um, into them to make them stronger, to make them more durable, whether or, or paints to make cheaper or more sustainable paints, at least potentially. Um, really everything. I would say the one exception might be sort of food and beverage. I think that there will never come a time where it's particularly healthy to ingest these, these type of materials. Um, but anything that helps improve the strength, the stability, the durability, um, cost efficiency, I think it has the potential to really just change all of these different fields, all of these different applications, um, because it's just sort of an enhancing agent. It has the potential not just to make something entirely new, but to take things that we already have and make them better. Is it fair to say that nanotechnology is considered additives to things? Like you add it to gasoline, you add it to batteries, or you add it to the coating on a, on a, pot, on a pan for the stove? Are they additives? It's definitely both. 
So there, there are times where, um, again, in the quantum computing, for example, um, if they, if if it was achieved with uh, nanoparticles, nanomaterials, it's very likely that um, this would be not the additive; it would be sort of the basis of the technology. It would be what's at the root of the technology. But a huge portion, maybe even the majority of the applications, yes, are additives. They're used as coatings. They're used as um, you know, me medically as like topical, uh, even creams potentially in the future. So I would say it's a it's a good mixture of both, but there isn't one that strikes me as a in a strong majority. Uh, let's see, uh, I'm seeing something here about robots. Any application for nanotechnology and robots? Uh, the robots that we could sort of touch and feel and see, no, but there is in terms of nanoscale robots. I mean, there's people who would like to make essentially artificial um, antibodies or viruses um, that they're not robots, how a lot of people, how we might think of robots, um, you know, these big automaton type of, of machines, but um, they ultimately would be a type of robotics and they could be at the nanoscale. So yes, and that would mostly have medical applications. Uh, just a, a question on the side. Life began somewhere in like that primordial soup. Is it possible that there was a, a nanotechnology additive in that soup that triggered life? Uh, the, again, another very interesting question. Um, in some sense, yes, only in the sense that, you know, we we still have a lot to learn on that front, but um what we know in general is that we started from the atoms and molecules that occurred naturally which were very very simple and somehow got more complex one way or the other and in in the evolution uh not not biological evolution even quite yet but the evolution of the inorganic uh molecules that led eventually to life um are probably had a phase of being at the nanoscale and making use of these nano these uh, nano properties. Now, again, uh, to just to make clear, that's sort of my own speculation. But if you imagine sort of that primordial soup or, or, or other models that have since been proposed that a lot of scientists are quite convinced by, um, it's very likely that that intermediate stage of complexity when things have shifted from just carbon and silicon and phosphorus and nitrogen and so on to slightly more complex um, molecules those nano, what, what really were nanoparticles could have played a dominant role, but we, we definitely don't know enough now to say. I have a question coming up from Danaline. Go ahead and unmute your microphone. Danaline, Noel. Yes, good afternoon once more. <laughs> I asked a question and you now must be satisfied that way. I wanted to know, you said that material science and nano science will underpin many of the most important features. Till now, I'm still asking, what about sustainable development? The waste of nano science, how are you going to use it for sustainable development? Yeah, the, I, I wish I, I had a bit of a better answer for everyone in terms of the sustainability. Um, Again, the things that I would highlight is that they are useful for new sustainable technologies. I keep giving that example of solar panels, but um, there are certainly that go well beyond. Um, and, and then they do pose a serious environmental risk, both in their uh, as waste and in their production. Um, but in terms of sustainable development beyond those two things, um, there's nothing at least that I'm aware of, again, just because of how much this has the potential to touch on and, and, and enhance. I'm sure there are other ways um, beyond the scope of my knowledge about how they, they help to contribute towards sustainable development. But I guess I would say at the end of the day, sustainable development uh, comes down to using the right materials. It's about having materials that get the job done for their application and that won't slowly degrade and contaminate the environment or require huge amounts of energy to produce in the first place. So again, in my opinion, a lot if not the vast majority of, of technology and the things around us in our lives 
um, are dominated by the, the properties of the materials chosen for the job. Do naturally occurring plants, you know, just plants in general, do they produce nanoparticles, nanotechnology in that sense? Um, a lot of the, a lot of the, the, the compounds or the, the proteins or, or biological, biologically active specimens, I suppose, um, are nanoscale. I wouldn't necessarily call them nanoparticles. Um, again, I'm sure the, the biological side of things is frankly just a little bit of my own uh, weak point, just because most of my experience has been a little more physics focused. So I'm sure that the answer is yes, that there's, there's just that there's enough complex biology and chemistry going on with all of the, the wide diversity of plants that exist in the world that I'm sure there are examples. Um, but for the most part, we're still talking about the atomic molecular uh, regime. So we're so a little bit smaller than what would typically be considered uh, nanoscale. You know, when you look at a, a seed that can lay dormant for a thousand years, Somehow it's storing energy like a battery, correct? In a way, yeah. How do you know how it does that? Yeah, it's it's interesting because it almost feels like a, a paradox or or some sort of. Um, when I first had this explained to me, I, I, it just didn't make sense because you're right. It's you can have a seed that's hundreds and hundreds of years old, and the moment you give it the right conditions, you know, oxygen, nitrogen in the soil, um, and light, it will sprout and, and begin to grow. And the way I like to think about it is sort of, um, it's very different than a battery because essentially you have a potential energy in the form of chemical energy. So within, within the seed, you have all of the different components necessary for um, its growth and for life, but they remain unused and, and quite well preserved. So you can think of it, they're all sort of compartmentalized within the seed and only upon giving it the right conditions is that is that battery going to discharge essentially is that are you going to start using uh the 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 fuel source of the yeah. to start growing it so it's just it's essentially several different chemicals sealed up very nicely where um without the right conditions everything sort of just stays the same and is is untapped Uh, let's see. I don't see any more questions. Yes, I have a question. Honda? Honda? Yes. Ghetto? Yes. Go ahead with your question. Yeah, I have a question. Thank you. Uh, Are you able to turn down the music in the background? Okay. Okay. I'm on my way. It sounds like he's in a, on a, yeah. like a computer center. Uh, yeah, I already closed. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I want to ask uh, Mr. Taylor, uh, you see the nanotechnology is the improved system of science derived from which source? You see, what is the essence of nanotechnology? The essence of semiconductor is the electronic material that will work in between the conductor and non-conductor. So a third, uh, the nanotechnology will work in which interface? What is the essence of this nanotechnology? Another way around also, uh, how this nanotechnology improve this method of solving problems in science? Thank you. So, yeah, um, again, it's a little bit interesting and maybe a little bit strange because it's sort of a combination of things because, you know, you mentioned that in the case of semiconductors, sort of the essence of the about it is it's semiconductors have a certain behavior. They have a certain type of properties, um, but it's not really different for the nanomaterials and the nanoparticles if they are made of, of semiconductors. So in the quantum dot example I gave you, they absorb and emit light in that very interesting way. Um, but it's still ultimately because they're semiconductors. Um, the physics of, of how all of that takes place, it's the, the same essence that makes a lot of our electronics interesting because they are uh, semiconductors is exactly what makes uh, these nanoparticles uh, interesting because they're semiconductors. 
I would say that the nano element, the, the, the change in the properties sort of takes what, what applies um, at other sizes, at the bigger sizes and makes them more, adds another dimension to them, adds another, another set of parameters. Um, so it's sort of, I would say it's the same essence for the most part. It will, it will just depend on, are we talking about nanomaterials, nanoparticles made from semiconductors or metals uh, or carbon? Um, but typically, if I had to say, the essence would, would be the same as it is on, on the bigger scale. I get a sense that there's no more questions. I don't see anything, no one's hand is raised, no questions in chat. I think at that point, we could be done with the, uh, the live session on nanotechnology right now. Oh, cool. we do have another question from Emmanuel cool. Wood. And Daniel, yes, please do. Let me take okay. one more. Uh, let me be the last shot there. So uh, I'm just looking at uh, the use of uh, nature, uh, which we know as a uh, biometric. Uh, so how is nanotechnology tapping into that field using uh, nature? to try to improve uh, nanotechnology to solve human problems? Yeah, it's, a, it's another good question. Um, I think it goes back to another previous question as well about what whether plants are producing or other biological forms of life are producing uh, nanoparticles. Um, again, th this, is, this is something sadly a little bit beyond the, the scope of my knowledge, but what I can say is that this entire field of, of doing as you say and sort of of looking to nature to see how we can develop and improve our own technologies is called biomimicry. Um, and I think, honestly, it applies a little bit less to the field of nanoscience than it does some other different fields. Um, but again, surely, um, I'm sure there is significant research looking at um, a lot of the, again, plant proteins, plant molecules, plant nanoparticles that are being emitted. We also have another one that comes to mind is in the case of bioluminescence. So um, these animals that are able to produce sort of their own light source for one reason or another, I think many of those um, are sort of based in nanotechnology. Um, but I don't think we do too much looking to nature for advice, just because uh, the nanoscience is a very strange space between uh, the atoms and molecules that we're most familiar with and that are most common in nature um, and the very large size of, of of those coming together to fill, build complex organisms. Daniel Justino, go ahead and unmute your microphone. Can you, un, uh, can you unmute your microphone, Daniel Justino? Let me give you a button there that you can click on. There you go. Oh. Go ahead and activate again. Try it again. Okay. Good afternoon. I would like to know if it's time to come according to what uh, Mr. Taylor said. If you are going to completely abandon the energy that is now to go on uh, with uh, Hello? this nano science, precisely the renewable energy. Do you mind repeating that? Sorry, I just had a little bit of a hard time hearing you. Donnelline, go ahead and repeat your question. All right. I'd like to know, since you said the future strength, the future strength concerning renewable energy, according to nanoscience that you are explaining, I'd like to find out for it's with time to come in the future, not the nearest future. We may probably abandon the energy we are using now to use renewable energy all over the world. Yeah, I would say um, I don't. I, a few things. One is I think nanoscience. Nanoscience will play a role, um, but I don't think it will be the dominant role. I think material science more broadly um, will play a more dominant role. So it won't be specifically nanoscience. Um, but I do think that the, the very unclean, unsustainable forms of energy that we use most of the time now will be phased out. Um, I think actually the most exciting direction on that front is, is nuclear energy. I think that um, some of you may have heard not long ago, there was a, a major development 
in nuclear fusion, which is a type of, of energy generation using uh, nuclear physics that we currently don't have a mastery of. But if and when we do, this is a type of energy that uses um, essentially seawater. So rather than having any of these um, oil, coal, natural gas, or anything else, um, we'd actually just be using seawater, which is of course, widely abundant, and there's no threat of us, you know, con going, consuming all of the water in the ocean. We're using a specific type of, of um, atom and molecule that's a small percentage of the overall ocean water, and it's very, very clean. There's no, there's no greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it produces enormous amounts of energy, and if and when that we are able to achieve this, um, it will be one of the biggest steps forward humanity has taken for a long time, and hopefully, um, for everybody in the world, because you don't need these nuclear power plants um, every in every country. You could have even perhaps one or a handful per continent, or even in one continent that's distributing it across the world. So I think nuclear fusion is by far the most exciting and the most likely candidate to replace um, fossil fuels and, and current unsustainable energy technologies. But um, I do think renewable energy will always play a dominant role, even if we get uh, nuclear fusion up and running. I think solar, wind, geothermal, hydrothermal um, will always continue to to play a part. Okay, now we go to Daniel Justino. Let me ask you to unmute your microphone again. Daniel Justino, are you there? Right. Go ahead. Okay, uh, my I have questions. My, my, my question is about uh, in education deeply, but uh, someone was speaking about this and I needed to give another question. My question is, what is the drawbacks of those technology? Because it, those technology will be uh, uh, wonderful for us in the future, but we need to know the drawbacks of those technology. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead. Sorry, well, somebody I'm might. Have... I'm clear. Oh yes, yes. Your question is clear. Um, yeah. Uh, again, an important question. I'm. I, I hopefully I'm not repeating myself too much. The there are many potential drawbacks, and again, it will depend. Um, sounding like a broken record again, it will depend on on the chosen material that you're using in the application. Um, I'll give you one example again from from the nano crystals from the quantum dots. Um, in the example of those those nice files showing those very bright colors, um, that those particular samples, which are some of the best that we've developed so far, are made from cadmium metal, and cadmium is extremely carcinogenic, uh, very toxic, horrible for both human and animal health as well as uh, the environment in in all sorts of other ways. So um, we're not for that reason we're not using these cadmium based nanoparticles in many of the applications uh, that we would like to just because they're too detrimental. So there is work being done to sort of replace them with with less uh, equally uh, good functioning materials, but less dangerous materials. Um, but again, the drawback probably will be at the end of the day, these big companies um, and even sometimes universities often um, are looking out for themselves. And what we'll have is we'll have something better than that extreme case of using cadmium, um, but these materials very well might end up posing a threat to the environment, whether it's through improper waste disposal. Um, I, actually, I would say improper waste disposal is probably the, the number one factor. If we're able to dispose of this waste properly and treat it properly, I think everything should be fine. I'm not so concerned with um, having the applications like solar panels degrade over time and entering the environment. I think it's more of once it's been used for its intended purpose and it's now waste. I think the biggest drawback is that uh, it very well could enter the environment in a dangerous way. Uh, Tyler, just on a, another note, do you know of any material that actually produces energy as it changes temperature up and down? Um, that produces energy as it changes temperature, right? Yeah, like if you leave a if you leave it out from day to night to day to night, just the change in temperature, it will produce energy. Um, in some sense, uh, for the most part, uh, I suppose the answer is no. But for example, um, using a day to night example, 
I mean, if something is sitting in the sun all day, it's going to be absorbing all of that energy. And depending on the material, um, when it's nighttime and now the temperature is much cooler, it's going to, it's going to emit and radiate uh, that energy back out to the environment. But it's not so much producing energy, it's more um, just conserving energy. It's, it's, it's not itself a, a production. So off the top of my head, no, I can't think of anything that's necessarily producing energy um, from a temperature change, but the properties are definitely going to change uh, with the temperature. You know, there's a whole field of research dedicated to uh, superconducting materials where they take materials and cool them down to very, very low temperatures. And that makes them more electrically conductive or more thermally conductive. And it makes their properties very interesting and useful for all sorts of different things. But producing energy typically isn't one of them. Okay, we have a question here from Karen Ann. Is there a standards agency which streamlines or supervises, so to speak, biomimicry work so that nanotechnology insertions do not bypass the human memory system? Does that make sense? Um, I think so. Um, I don't believe there is, at least in terms of biomimicry. I mean, we, there, there's institutions like in the U.S., the, there's the uh, Environmental Protection Agency, and they do a lot of work sort of along these lines, just in the sense of, of managing waste disposal and waste treatment and so on. Um, but in terms of biomimicry, at least as far as I know, and, and I'm, I'm fairly confident this is the case, I don't think there are any institutions or regulatory bodies that are dedicated to biomimicry in particular. Yeah, because this is an international research and development project. And that gets very difficult to try and go in and try to supervise internationally. Yeah, exactly. Okay, I think, do you have anything more to say, Tyler Gleckler? Uh, no, I mean, I really appreciate you guys listening. I know that a lot of this, it's always hate hard to gauge everyone's interest. It's very, very dry for some people and very, very interesting for others. So I hope that this was enjoyable or helpful. And again, if there's anything else, don't feel rushed. I'm very happy to correspond via email. Um, and I, I just hope this was good for everybody. Oh, by the way, do you have the link to your podcast? I can definitely include it. Um, I, I can share it in chat if that's easiest or whatever. Yes, you might. that would be easiest. Sure. Um, just one moment. I'll stop sharing my screen now, I suppose, because I think we're good. Yeah, Tyler Gleckler has a podcast. What's the name of your podcast? Uh, the podcast is called Wiser Tomorrow, and it's sort of exactly what it sounds like. I've, I've been speaking with scientists and entrepreneurs and a little bit of everybody, but with a focus on science and technology. So if you're interested in, in a number of these different topics, marine biology, physics, chemistry, um, Hopefully it's something that might appeal to you. I think your work would really would really benefit from like a blog where you can do like daily or weekly articles talking about the research you're doing, things you're finding out around the world. Yeah, that's something that I've been really meaning to get to. And, and actually I, on another tab here on this very computer, I, I have that in the works. I've just been a little bit, uh, I think too strict with getting that going. My, my expectations I think are a little too high. <laughs> There's some um, good videos on YouTube on how to set up a blog. Yeah, I need to, I, I definitely need to watch a few more of those. I'm looking for the, uh, for the chat, but now I can't seem to find it. Uh, it should be down below in the, the list of menu options next to share screen. Do you see it chat? Um, oh yes, thank you very much. I don't, I don't know how I missed that actually. I just have a, a monitor in front of me that's uh, eclipsing. <laughs> the the screen a little bit. Yeah, just to kind of recap everybody, nanotechnology may seem like it's very distant from your experience, but if you bring it down to your life, the materials around you can be used for nanotechnology. And all it takes is some of you to sit there and think about it and notice certain things. And all of a sudden the answers start to just come alive right there in the moment then those are the things that the world is waiting for. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, I think, thank you so much, Tyler Gleckler. Really, really a fascinating, important topic.
I appreciate that. And thank you again. It's, I, I hope I made it interesting for everyone. At least there was something for everybody. So apologies if I, if I failed you on that, but hopefully for most of you, it was good. All right. So did, do we have the uh, link in yes, chat? I, I put that in chat. Yes. I don't actually see it in chat. Does anybody oh. else see it? Get it. Uh... Also, thank you for all the very kind comments in chat. I, I'm just I'm just seeing that now. So for everybody who I didn't get the chance to respond to, again, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And like I said, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, I'm very. This is this is how I live my life. This is what I love to do and what I love to talk about. So it's it's been a pleasure. Oh, I see it now. It's a YouTube channel. Yeah, it's on it's on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and all of those as well. But the easiest link was was for YouTube. Okay, perfect. I think with that, let me get back to the screen here. Thank you so much, Tyler Gleckler. Thank Very you. Very fascinating. Of course, anytime. Thank everybody for coming with their questions. Yes, thank you all. Thank you all for listening. Thank you all for engaging. Thank you for the great questions. And again, thank you for all the amazing comments that I see uh, coming in on the on Zoom. So thank you, thank you, thank you.